Hey everybody, welcome to The Mountain Gamer and welcome to this full playthrough of the advent of i Crim. Wait, what? What is that? Yeah, it's an expansion that I made for Runebound 3rd Edition. A full expansion, well, almost full expansion. Basically everything except those 30 cards that you're supposed to shuffle into the adventure decks. But there's still a lot of stuff in here. It's a whole story and I do uh, employ some mechanisms that uh, have not been seen in Runebound so far, but I think it plays very well. I think it stays with the same feel and theme that Runebound has. So uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about it too much right now. Let's just get into it. It's going to be spread over a lot of videos because, you know, just because. I've put all the files you need in the comments. If you just want to print it out and get it going, things should be rather simple. But uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's get into it. The advent of Icor Krim. All right, so let's look at some of the things that you'll need to have and to print out in order to play this scenario. Over here we have the villain's card. Here is the villain's instructions. Um, I have made a puck for the villain. Now, uh, these plastic things are actually coin covers. It's for people who like to collect coins. Um, if you don't have that, you could just take uh, one of these um, these pieces of gold, probably like the, the three, which is bigger, and um, print out just on paper, this uh, this information here and stick it onto one of those gold tokens. You can, I mean, yes, it will be smaller, but you'll still get to chuck it like a token. Um, if we look at this really fast here, this has three surge, two surge, and contrary here, uh, the opposite. What you'll need also is to print out this elements pool. This is two-sided. We have instructions on this side, and this is the elements pool. I'll explain that when we get to that. Um, over here, I have what I call the Infernal Track. I am using, actually, uh, this is from uh, Aeon's End, but you could take probably one from Gloomhaven, maybe even King of Tokyo, or if anything, you could take uh, two D10s or a D100 or just a pad and pencil. This will, I believe, never go down. It's only going to go up, so you could just scribble down on a post-it or something um, whenever you need to. You will need six... five? <laughs> you will need five of these cubes here. Um, now I have just bought these really cheap, very light um, cubes from the dollar store and the, you can find them in the arts and crafts section. And then I've taken some, um, some printer uh, stickers and I just cut them out and uh, put them on this. So white is a light element. This is a dark side, so it's dark element. And this here is neutral. Now, if you don't want to do this, if it's too much trouble, you could actually use just regular D6s, like very small dice uh, that you're going to be putting on this track. And you could say that, um, you know, there's two white faces here. So one and two would be light element, three would be neutral, and then four, five, six would be dark element. That's actually what I, I did when I was testing out the game. I didn't do these. I would just roll some dice and you use them on this track. You will also need to print out this deck of story cards. Uh, you don't have to sleeve them. Um, these here are mini Euro cards, and these are bad things that will happen throughout the game. And you will need this pile here, which are perks that the heroes will get. I am also using the caves expansion that I have created, but you do not need to use that. This is just for fun, but if you want that, I have a video on that. I will be playing with it. You don't need to. You will need to print out the Blood Mage Elf here. This is um, like an acolyte of the enemy. And uh, they will be represented on the board by these five cubes. You could use anything. You could use monsters that you have from some other game, some miniatures or whatever. They are all basically the same, uh, the same thing. So each of these cubes is a Blood Mage Elf. This is what we call a roaming enemy. So with that in mind, you would need to also print out this roaming enemy's instruction sheet. Roaming Enemies is a variant that's on Board Game Geek. I think it's called Roaming Monsters. Uh, I have tweaked it and I now use it in every one of my scenarios and I make custom monsters for this sheet. Uh, we will also be playing with the benefits of civilization as well as some other rules here on the other side. I will put those up on screen just very quickly now. These are all um, rules and tweaks that we've picked up on Board Game Geek and we've cherry picked and you know we always play with these now. I made a video on that if you want to go see that, but let's not get crazy with that right now. If I end up using some of these rules in the game, I will let you know. 
Uh, over there we have the Beneath Terranoth, so that's just the, ex the explanation for my Caves variant. But again, you do not need that to play this scenario, it's really just for fun. And speaking of variants that we use, you might notice that we have four items instead of three in the cities. That's just one of the things we do. And one of the reasons that I'm doing that, uh, not only to get, you know, more things and more choices, but it's also because in this uh, asset deck, I have actually shuffled everything that I own. So I have everything that comes with the base game, but I also have the assets for... Uh, the Mountain's Rise and the Gilded Blade. Now I know in the rule book they say, oh, you should pick and choose only certain and, you know, we, forget it. We play epic. We put everything in this deck. And that's one of the reasons why we have four items per city instead of three. And lastly here, I will be playing with the combat boards just to automate the enemy. Because as I'm playing solo, um, I don't want to make all the decisions for the enemy. So I'm using these combat boards. Now, because I don't have Unbreakable Bonds, I don't have all of the tokens necessary for the usual combat boards that come in Unbreakable Bonds, because these this is where these are from. Um, so what I've done is I've gone Board Game Geek and somebody has actually made like tweaked versions of these combat boards that you can use, uh, you know, with just the regular version of the game. Uh, in Unbreakable Bonds, you know, you have these special tokens with these, you know, like uh, these charge uh, effects and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, what the user has done is tweak them so that you can play with the basic tokens. So I will be using that. You do not have to, but uh, I find that it makes things easier. One more thing that we've brought over from Unbreakable Bonds is the fact that you can save an action. So I've made this little token here. It's going to show up every once in a while. So uh, if, if in a turn I use only two actions instead of three, I might put this next to my character to show that I have an action to spend on my next round. Uh, just quickly here, something else you'll need, um, just a regular D6 for the roaming enemies and a D3. Now I've actually taken the trouble of making this an actual D3, um, but you know, you can just use a D6 and make it so that 1, 2 is 1, 3, 4 is 2, and 5, 6 is 3. So put this next to the board. And just before we actually start playing here, um, one of the variants that we play with, and it's particularly important for this scenario, is the fact that we have three prologue rounds. We always play this way, but like I said, it's important here. So I will be tracking this with this die here to show that we have three turns even before starting the first round of the game. And with that, let's go look at the setup sheet for the advent of Ikor Krim. All right, so on the setup here, it says the Infernal Energy Track starts at zero. Well, this is this thing right here. So it starts at zero. After that, turn one element cube times number of player to their black side, then roll the rest. Uh, so it says add, you know, one to its black side. So you'd put that on the track here and then we would roll the rest. Oh, okay, that's pretty good. All right, so we'll put those here. Next, it says add five roaming enemies to the map. See roaming enemies card. Okay, so we will set them up according to the card. So that means Exile Peak, Echo Lake, Weeping Basin, Kernum Lake, and Tanglewood. Now, when you're going on Tanglewood, you choose which of these hexes to use. Now, it also says here, during all of Act 1, whenever a roaming enemy is removed from the map, add its token to the next gold space of the time track. Whenever the time tracker hits a uh, roaming enemy's token, add it back to the map in order 1 to 5. Order 1 to 5 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And what this means is if you kill somebody, let's say, you know, we're here in the game and you would, you know, kill this guy, it would go on the next available yellow space. And when this eventually comes back down, you'll check at which one you are here. So one, two, three. So then you would put it on the third spot. One, two, three. You would put it here. There probably would not be a guy here at that time, but that's where it would go. Now we can quickly look here. It says at end of round, you would first execute the roaming enemies phase. Okay, I'll show you how that works when we get to it. Then you would increase the infernal track by the number of black cubes. So what this means is at the end of every round, you're gonna look at what's going on here. And for every black cube, you will raise this by one. Now, what does this do? Okay, well, let's keep reading. If the infernal track reaches a new 10, draw an event card. So every time this hits 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, etc., you would draw an event card. And events are usually bad things. Let's just, you know, look at the bottom one here for fun. Ambush. All heroes suffer three damage. 
So it's all bad stuff like this. The thing is, this Infernal track here is going to actually generate the score for the villain. So now you're saying, okay, so my job is to try to keep these things down. Yes, you can actually do that, and I'll get to that a bit later. Now, when this thing reaches approximately 70, 73, um, the villain is, uh, it's gonna be time to fight the villain. So you'll divide 73 by 5.5, and you'll round it up and then multiply by the number of players. But for here, it's times one. So usually when you fight the villain, he's about a 12, anything between 10 and 13. I know it seems like a lot of math for now, but let's not worry about it. So if we keep reading here, um, moving the time tracker. So during act one, when the time tracker reaches a gold space, each player receives a perk. Now perks are um, good things <laughs> that you will be receiving, and some of them will be one-time use, but some of them will be tap to activate. And I'll get to that when we get to that. And next it says throughout on a gem refresh space, also refresh all perks. So when the time tracker reaches a yellow space, we gain a perk, and when it reaches a gem refresh, if we've spent some of these perks, we can uh, you know, untap them or refresh them. Now the rest of the uh, instructions here, let's not really go through those. This is actually for spawning the villain. So this villain is gonna spawn at the start of the fifth round of act two. But when we get to act two, I'll put a token here somewhere to remind us that that's gonna happen. And before we start playing, the last really important bit here, if you look under Icor Crim, it says, heroes may spend one action to, in a civilized hex, turn one element cube to its light side or white side. And in a shrine, turn two elements to their white side. So this is what we were talking about before. Now throughout the game, you're gonna wanna get rid of some of these black cubes for various reasons. And the way to do that is to spend actions to flip them to their white side. So of course the best place to do this in is in a shrine because for one action you're gonna flip two of those and in a regular civilized hex it's just one. Now we will also be using these element cubes because uh, some of the perks that we have in order to activate them we need to consume two or three or four or five of these cubes and when you consume you actually take them off you activate the perk but then we have to re-roll those cubes and they might fall on the black side, which is something that we're trying to avoid. And now with all that being said, I would actually start the first prologue round, and I won't get into the story now because the story actually comes into play on the second round of the three round prologue. So let me show you my character for now. Now I have chosen Alyssa, and I did so because I think she's well balanced here, but also because I really like this, uh, this ability here. So for one surge, stock prey. Explore to deal one damage for each terrain symbol you roll that matches your hex. This is a pretty cool thing. You kind of get to gamble with your attacks. So if I can spend a surge, I'll roll three dice, potentially more if I get more dice, but at least three. And if they match my, my, my terrain, that's like a, you know, a guaranteed hit. She does have very low health. That kind of sucks. And she starts with three of the um, skill cards. So let's draw those right now. Before we do that, uh, she also has nine lives. After you are defeated, you may exert to heal all damage. So maybe we'll do that. There you go, let's draw her skill cards. So the first one here is Raised in the Wild. You may adventure by spending one action instead of two. This is uh, it's pretty funny because, okay, one of the variants we have is called Easy Exploring. And what it says is we can now explore these uh, green gems here, these uh, adventure gems for one action instead of two. All other gems will still be two actions, but for the green ones, it's just one action. Now, the reason for this is we wanted to encourage more exploration, so that's the way we play at our house. Let's draw our next skill. Circle of Protection. Once per combat round, you may exert and test mind, no, spirit, to cancel a surge ability. Hmm, yeah, maybe, but it's very expensive to build. Okay, and the third one, Cartography. Gain one gold whenever you gain an exploration trophy. Oh, okay, 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 that's pretty cool. On the back of this card, it also says that Lissa can start the game with a combat trophy. And I will do that right now. So this is her combat trophy. And it also says that she needs to start the game on a shrine. So let's do that. Here we go. I've decided to start on Madman's Pass, which is a shrine because my idea is I wanna try and get one of those purple or green exploration gems. 
So let's roll our exploration dice. Okay. So this means we could use the hills here and the hills here. I could actually go all the way to this green gem um, or I just go here. I think because my roll is so awesome, <laughs> I'm going to uh, actually go uh, right up to here. So that was my first action. And for my second action, I will be exploring. As I said, these green gems for us, uh, when we play at our house, they only cost one action. And here is the exploration card. At River's End, a major port town such as Riverwatch always draws the land's best merchants, supplies, and business folk. One action, explore Riverwatch. Wow, I'm right next to Riverwatch. This is good. So we could either take a dip in a stream, no bonus. <laughs> okay, fun. Engage in trade with river merchants, gain two gold. Or swipe good from the local market. Take one assets from the Riverwatch market. Okay, this is going to be tough to do. It's water. Yeah. All right, so for now, let's just put it next to our character card. And I like to put these little markers here, both on the card and on the city, to know where I'm going and what it's for. Okay, I have one more action, so I'm kind of torn between going here for this purple one, or maybe here, and then actually going to Riverwatch for that quest. So let's roll some dice and see what we get. Okay. So what can we actually do with this? Well, I mean, we can go right back here. That is doable. Or else, what can we do? This would get us onto the road. This would get us here. Uh, whoa, <laughs> it's like I'm heading for this guy. No, 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 no. So yeah, this would get us here. Maybe we just try and go to Riverwatch. We could do one, two, three and just go closer. Okay, yeah, why not? Let's do that. Get rid of that. So that was our third action. So before we move on to round two, we have some stuff to do. So first we'll execute the roaming enemies phase. So what you do for the roaming enemies is you're going to roll a D3 to figure out how many spaces each of these red cubes will move. And then for each of the cubes, you will, you will roll a D6 to figure out where they will move. So let's do that first. Okay, they're gonna move one space, that's good. And then let's roll a die for each of these guys. Now, if you refer to the chart here, it's pretty easy to understand. It's like cardinals, basically one, two, three, four, five, six. So let's just do it for this guy and see how it works. So he's gonna move one, we determined that, in the direction of four. So he's gonna go here. This one here, in the direction of five. This one here, direction of three right here. Oh, he's adjacent to me. We're going to have to fight. Let's move the other ones, but that's going to happen. This one here, direction of six. Now, okay, I'm going to explain this right now. Um, when you are unable to at least move one space in the direction that is proposed here, you go to the polar opposite. So he can't go there. He'll go here. And lastly, this person here will go to five. Again, five would be here. It's impossible. So they would go there. Now, when a roaming enemy finishes its turn on or adjacent to a hero that is on an uncivilized hex, and that's the situation right now, that roaming enemy will jump into your space and a combat will ensue. So we have to fight this Blood Mage Elf right now, even before the end of the first prologue round. So let's put the Blood Mage Elf card here up front so we can see what they do. So this is a mystic humanoid. They have a health of seven. It says before combat, if there are four black energy cubes, this enemy will never take more than one damage for each combat action during the whole combat. And we're pretty lucky because um, we don't have that. And if we keep reading here, uh, these are their special abilities. So two surges, I mean, this won't happen, but if they get that, uh, blood magic deal three damage then suffer two damage so she would actually heal her um, uh, damage herself in order to hit you for one surge channel dark um, if at least one black elements cube deal one damage and heal one if there are three black cubes also deal one uh, charge i believe they've their, their call i'll check it out later and we also have um 
they can spend one of these uh, chicken feathers here <laughs> for blackest knife consume two black energy cubes to deal one of these charge so we'll see if any of that activates so let's go get her mystic board well actually this is it right there okay so she's got seven health i didn't show you our combat tokens but here they are so we have one of those agility they're called so agility with a surge on the other side this is a magic damage and another agility and a shield and two axes or battle damages so let's chuck all of these tokens let's see what we have first okay so this is us and let's do it for the blood mage elf All right, so let's put them on the combat board here and they will activate accordingly. So these are blanks, damage, damage, surge, and the agility. Okay. Now it looks like there's a tie for initiative, you know, because of these yellow symbols. So in this case, I would be the one who would go first. So let's do that. What can we do? Well. Uh, see, they block magic damage, but it's a good thing we don't have any. So I think it's a good time to just go in, right? So I would use two to give her two damage, and I will actually signify that damage with dice here. So she's on two, on seven, and now it's her turn. She will waste this agility, and it says flip blank to double, first choice. Can she do that? Yes. So she would waste that to flip a blank to double. Okay. Next to us, uh, we need to think about this. Well, actually, I could use my Stalk Prey ability because I'm on a um, one of those field uh, hexes there, so I could potentially do some damage. What I'm hoping is gonna happen is she'll double her Surge, which will bring her to the Blood, ma blood Magic here. And yes, she will deal me three, but she'll suffer two, so she'll go down pretty quick. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna be using my Surge to roll three dice. And hopefully I get some of those field um, results. Okay, well that's two. So she does suffer two damage, bringing her to four. Okay, this is working out pretty well. And then she would double the surge first. And yes, she could do that. So she'll double that surge. Now you'll notice my boards are a little bit smaller than the regular combat boards. That's just me. I just wanted it to fit in the box nicely. Okay, back to us. I will be using... Can I use Agility? I could use Agility. Yeah, why not? So I will use Agility... Oops. To just recast this token here. It hasn't been doubled or anything, so I can. And I'm hoping to get the shield result. So let's do that. Oh, yeah, that... I mean, can I redo that? It, I, it didn't even flip, right? All right, let's, let, let's do this. Let's do it right. Okay, go. Ah, oh, same thing. Okay. Well, whatever. So it still goes here. And then it goes back to her. She will waste two of these uh, surges to activate blood magic. Deal three, then suffer two damage. So I'm gonna take three damage. I will also use dice here. So three. And she'll suffer two, bringing her to six. So she's one away from dying. It would come back to me, I have nothing to do. Then it goes to her. She's gonna spend two here to give me two damage, bringing me to five on nine. This is, uh, this is hurting. <laughs> okay, so let's go to round two. I think I'm gonna chuck everything together, so let's do it. Okay, so this is us. And this is her. Wow, she's got a lot of this damage. She's got like three. She has one surge and a doubler. And who goes first? Oh, us. Okay, cool. Oh, wow. We can't attack at all. Man, that's horrible. I think I'm gonna be using my agility to flip this to a surge. So yeah, I'm doing agility to flip one of my tokens. Then it goes back to her. She will try to double a surge. Okay. And then it comes back to me. I'm gonna waste my, I'm gonna use my surge here to do the stock prey again, to try and roll some terrain dice and hit her in the face. Oh yes, that's one damage and she cannot block it. So she's up to seven. She's out of here. Nice. 
and it says here when you defeat a ro roaming enemy, uh, two gold plus you can turn four dark cubes into white. Now we only have one up there, so I mean I could do it, and you know what? I think I will. Also, I should mention that in the general rules for the roaming enemies, and she is one of those, you always add one gold to the reward here. So that would be three gold and, you know, fiddle around with these cubes. So let's go get that gold. So that's three gold for me. And so that was the roaming enemies phase for the first prologue round. So if we uh, look at the card up here, then it says increase the infernal track by the number of black cubes. But we have none. So that's pretty good. And then it says, uh, re-roll the element cubes. So we re-roll all of this. Okay, so we have here two whites and three black. Or I should say three light and three dark. Now let's not forget, because I have defeated this roaming enemy, we would remove it and put it on the first available gold space of the time track. And with that, it is the actual end of the first round of the three round prologue. So let's move this to round two. And that means it's time to actually draw the first story card. As it says here, draw this at the start of the second round of the three round prologue. So the advent of Ikor Krim. Let's read that together. The elvish blood mage cult known as the Sisters of Krim have opened a portal to Infernal, a plane of reality made of negative energy and are letting loose its evil influence across the land. Once this force reaches its zenith, Ikor Krim, the cult's master, will take physical form and ultimately bring doom to Terranoth. Having learned of this, the Order of Light Mages has been fighting strong to hold back the spread of this vile power by countering it with both neutral and light energies, all the while joining forces with you, brave heroes of Terranoth. Heroes choose one starter perk. And then whenever the time tracker reaches a gold space, each player draws one perk. Okay, so these perks here, starter perks. We have a choice between basic alchemy, consume two light energies to gain two gold, then tap this card. So we'll be able to use that during the game uh, more than once. Or the Blessing of Light, consume two light energies to heal all wounds on any hero in the wilderness, then tap this card. So when you're playing with more than one uh, hero, this is pretty useful. But I can actually heal myself as well. So which one do I want? I think for the start of the game, I'm gonna go with this because it is actually, we do actually have that over there too. So I'm gonna probably do that to uh, gain some gold. So I'll take this and I will shuffle this one in with the other perks and uh, we're gonna get to use them later on in the game. So for now, this is mine. I'll put it next to my character sheet. Now, as my first action, I will just move into River Watch. So that's one. I will now try to do this thing here. And so again, this says at River's End, a major port town such as River Watch always draws the land's best merchants, supplies and business folk. So for one action, I can explore River Watch. And what I'm trying to get here would be either this result or this result. So a water in a field or a water in two wilds. Well, good luck with that. Oh, are you kidding me? Are you people? Come on. What are the odds? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giddy with joy. Okay, so we get to swipe goods from the local market. Take one asset from the River Watch market. That's insane. We could actually take the twin daggers, like, for free. Whoa! Okay, okay, okay. Wow, what does this thing do? It, well, it's worth 10. Even if we don't like it, we can just, you know, sell it back. So it's got two surges and one uh, combat damage. For one surge, stab, deal one combat damage that cannot be blocked. Okay, that's good. And then for X number of surges, cripple, deal X number of combat damage if your foe has at least one damage. People, this is crazy. Okay, I'm, I'm, I mean, yeah, I'm doing this. So I'm stealing this, basically swiping goods from the local market. Let's actually just replenish here quickly. Okay, so patchwork wand. Okay, that's a uh, tactics icon here. All right, so uh, this was a great success and this would actually become a trophy now. 
So this is another trophy we have. This is actually something we own now, so I'll go get that uh, pog later on. And we have wasted two actions so far. I keep saying wasted. I'm going to do that all through the, uh, the playthrough. That's just me being a francophone. We say dépenser une action, which is to waste an action. I know I should say use, but you might hear me say waste a lot. So I've wasted two actions. Now I am in Riverwatch and um, I could probably just do a heal to get rid of all this damage because it's going to be too costly later on. So let's just do that. So my third action will be to heal myself. We now move on to the roaming enemies phase. So our roaming enemies will be moving one space. And let's do this one here. Direction of four, that would be here. This guy here, direction of four again. This one, direction of five, that would be here. And this one, direction of five, which would be back to Tangle, would you go? Next up, we have to increase the infernal track by the number of black cubes here. So that means three. Okay. And then we shuffle all of them. All right, three light and two dark. Good. And with that done, we now begin the third round of the three round prologue. So the first thing I'm going to do is take an action to uh, probably buy this thing here. Uh, first, we're going to draw a new asset card. Oh, okay. This one is uh, this one is actually free. Um, I wanted to get the relic here because the shrine is way up here. Well, way up here. It's like three hexes away. Although the stronghold is right here. Hmm. Okay. Well, this seems like a no-brainer for. So my first action will actually be to buy this one here put that next to my character sheet and my second action i'm thinking i should buy this one here just for my first few times that i sell some stuff because it says here each time you trade a goods gain one additional gold so i figure why not so for a second action i will be spending a gold to well again i should have drawn another card first <laughs> Well, okay, so it seems like I should probably take this. Oh, no, I cannot have two goods at the same time. True, 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 true. Okay, so I am taking the royal uniform for one gold. I have already put that in the supply. So now this is mine. And so that was two actions for my third action. I'm going to try and make it uh, all the way up here. So let's roll some dice. Okay, a lot of... Uh, a lot of fields and forests, so field, field, hmm. I could exert to roll again, but I don't know that I'm gonna do that really. Let me think about this. So I could actually use these three results to uh, just go here to try and get one of those socials. Or actually, no, actually, I could get here. Now, the reason that I'm hesitating between going here or here is because in my un- uh, prepared or unlearned skills, I have this here, cartography. I could gain one gold whenever I gain one of these trophies. Um, I wanted to maybe build that or learn that. And I could actually do it right now. I could just spend, you know, one of the green trophies that I gained earlier to learn that. And then when I go do this one, but then again, I won't do this one right away, but hmm. Yeah, let's just do it. So I will be spending this to actually learn this skill. So I'll put it up top with my character. And then for my move, I will keep the original idea that I have. I will do one, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, so that was my three actions. We now move on to the roaming enemies phase. So we'll roll the D3 first. They will be moving three, okay. This one here, direction of one. So that's one, two, three. This one here, direction of four, so that's one, two, three. One, two, three. This one, direction of six, that would be one, two, three. And this one, also direction of six. Now, see, six is this way, it's impossible, so it would go one, two, three. Now, uh, this is a civilized hex, but it is not stopping there, so it can actually like fly over or run through. So, one, two, three. As long as it doesn't end its turn on a civilized hex, you're fine. 
and now we must raise the infernal track equal to the number of dark elements here. So that would be two, bringing it up to five. And then we must reroll all of these cubes. Okay, two dark and three neutral. Now this brings us to the first round of Act One. So I'm gonna stop it here for tonight and we will continue with the advent of Icor Crim in the next video. And if you want some more videos, YouTube thinks you might like the one on the left. I personally think you might enjoy the one on the right. And if you want to make sure to never miss any of my videos, I would ask you to click the middle button here to, of course, subscribe.